Today is April the 2nd, 2018. My name is Tanya Pitcham. I'm with Oklahoma State University. And today I am in Stillwater at the Public Library to interview Caroline Diedrich Dibble. And this is part of our, our project on STEM, the STEM areas and women, science, technology, engineering, math. Right. And as I understand it, you have a degree in chemical engineering, right? Um, it's industrial engineering. It's for sure. mm -hmm. Stand corrected. Industrial engineering. It's still engineering, so yeah. that's good. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming today. And let's begin with learning a little bit about you, beginning with when and where you were born. Okay. I was born on April 7th, 1986 in Perryton, Texas. The birthday coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next weekend. And tell us a little bit about your family. Okay. Um, I have one younger brother, um, so I was the oldest of two. Um, big OSU family. Um, my parents both came here. Um, they actually met when they were in middle school, in Sunday school. Um, so they have a pretty crazy story about how they eventually ended up together, but started dating here at OSU. Um, and then my brother and I both uh, followed in their footsteps and came here. So. And they had grown up in Texas? Um, my dad was born in Texas, but uh, they actually grew up in liberal Kansas and then both ended up moving to Woodward, Oklahoma. So that's the Oklahoma connection. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, what brought them to OSU to begin to begin with? Um, I think they just always liked the school, and you know, from Woodward, it was pretty pretty close. So, yeah. And with their degrees in ag or um, actually in business. Business, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mom. Well, both of them in accounting and uh, finance. And that's interesting. I mean, I guess OSU would be closer than OU at, at that point from from Woodward. Right. Although Texas schools might be a little closer. Um, yeah, could could have been. But out of state tuition at that point. Right, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And, and where did you go to elementary school? Um, Wright Elementary in Perryton. So Perryton's a pretty small town, about 8,000 people. So one, one school for, you know, one elementary school, one middle school, one junior high. So about how many were in your class at any given time? Um, I graduated with 99. Um, we probably had, you know, closer to 115 um, at different times. Well, that's pretty reasonable mm -hmm. size. Yeah. Did you have a favorite subject? Um, I always liked math. Um, that was probably, and I, I liked English as well, so kind of a, both sides of the brain, but yeah. Did you participate in ac activities outside of class? I did. Um, wasn't real athletic, but I did run cross country and track for a few years in junior high and through part of high school. And then um, got more involved in a student council in high school. Um, was involved in what they called a UIL academic contest, so spelling and math contest that we would do uh, once a year. And you had like district, regional, and state, depending on how well you you competed. Yeah. So you got the math interest from both sides of both parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mom's a math teacher, and my dad's a uh, financial advisor. Well, I've always heard music goes along with math. Do were you? In Music, musically inclined? Um, I took piano lessons from third grade on, okay. so wasn't real talented, but <laughs> did, did have that, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then did you work any while you were in high school? No, didn't. No. Well, it, after the summer after I graduated, I worked at the uh, high school for the counselor and helped her with scheduling and getting ready for the upcoming year. Well, at that point, did you know what your major was going to be or what your end goal was? to career-wise would be um, I, I didn't. Um, I thought that I was going to be an architectural engineer coming out of high school. Um, I always liked architecture, but I uh, didn't have enough artistic ability to uh, be an architectural engineer. I found out pretty quickly once I got here at OSU. Funny so, how that works, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Fortunately, they uh, throw you into the fire pretty quickly. The uh, intro to architecture class showed me a lot of what that would be about and how I was not suited for it. So. I found out in the first semester that I should look at something different. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you were deciding where to go, it wasn't just, you know, OSU was going to be it regardless? No, um, I applied to OSU and then four schools in Texas. Um, Texas Tech, uh, Texas Christian, Southern Methodist, and Texas A&M. And ended up coming down to Texas A&M and OSU. Mm -hmm. And I think I always knew that I kind of wanted to come here, but when you're from Texas, you kind of feel like you're supposed to look around. And mm -hmm. I was the oldest kid in the family, so, you know, it wasn't like I had a precedent of where a brother or sister had went or anything like that. So, yeah, And your so. parents were okay with you not going to OSU? Uh, yeah, yeah, they were. <laughs> they, they wouldn't have been real fond of me going to OU. My dad always jokes about how that's the only place he wouldn't have paid for me to go. Okay. But, um, 
I understand that too. Have that, have that for that rivalry in the family. But um, but yeah, they um, A and M was a long way from home. It was about an eleven hour drive from my hometown. So even though it was in Texas, it would have been considerable amount away from from family. Well, in Puritan, how far is is that? Um, it's just four hours from here. Oh gosh, you know, big difference. Then. Yes, yeah. This I could get home for my brother's football games on the weekends and and that sort of thing. So it was a uh, it's a much better fit for me. So what year did you graduate from high school? Two thousand four. So then you came here and you graduated from OSU in oh eight then. Um, oh nine actually. Oh. I went five years. Okay. And. Do you remember much about your first semester on campus as far as your impressions or with teachers or students or anything like that? Yeah, um, I mean, I was, uh, it turned out that it was good that I didn't go too far away from home because I didn't realize how much of a homebody that I was (laughs) until, you know, that time to leave came. So that was hard. Um, I remember just, you know, kind of going week by week and just, uh, you know, trying to get through that initial period of homesickness. but yeah, that, that intro to architecture class that I mentioned definitely stands out. Um, but I always enjoyed, you know, when I, whenever I wasn't thinking about home, I always enjoyed being here, being on campus. I always felt comfortable, so it didn't take too long to, to get acclimated. Where did you live that first semester? In Stout. Okay. I actually lived in Stout for my first three years here. Oh. You, you got used to it then. Pretty. I did. <laughs> Well, when you when you came, did you come by yourself, or did your parents come and drop you off, or they came and they came and dropped me off? Yeah, help me move in and all that good stuff. Any words of advice from them? Do you recall from that first that first day, or when they dropped you off? And, um, I mean, they made sure. I remember we went around campus and kind of walked around to figure out where my classes were, because you know you have your class schedule at that point. So, um, just making sure that I was you know acclimated and I. I, I mean, my mom still talks about how that was one of the hardest days for her was to leave me here. So, yeah, being the, the first of two. So, I'm thinking about that time you had cell phones, I'm assuming. We did. Uh, not smartphones, but cell phones. Yeah, you didn't have to worry about the, the hall phone being the only phone that you know to, to call home. Right. I do remember still having a dorm phone because I think they would call me on that occasionally because cell phones were, I mean, I probably talked more on that than anything else, but... Had you uh, received laundry instructions before you left home? Oh, yeah, and I was, I was pretty good about that. I okay. helped my mom do laundry and iron growing up. So, yeah, that wasn't too big of a shock. Okay. Would you have a favorite professor while you were here, once you got into your industrial engineering program? Yeah, I had a lot of great professors. Um, Camille DeYoung was one of my favorites. Uh, she's an industrial engineering professor, um, and she was, was great, um, you know, being a woman in that field and uh, – just her, her encouragement. She was just so much fun to be around. So I had two different classes with her and always enjoyed those. Is she still here? I don't know. I don't recognize the name. She is. Uh-huh. She is. I'll have yeah. to look her up. I know she, I think she's still in the Stillwater Board of Education too. Okay. Well, yeah. definitely check. And were there other, how, what was the ratio for male, female students? Do you remember an I a general idea. Um, in industrial engineering, we actually had more female than male in my class. Um, we only had a class of 12, and I want to say that there were seven or eight of us that were female, um, but that was definitely not indicative of the rest of the engineering department, so it was much more the other way, you know, probably 60% male, 30 to 40 female, I would guess. Well, were there more than one female professor in the program? Oh, gosh. In... Um, not in industrial engineering, probably in, in engineering as a whole, I'm sure there were. Well, what was it about industrial engineer that, that attracted you? Um, yeah, well, after I figured out that architectural engineering was not for me, um, I still liked the the idea of engineering and uh, wanted to stay in that college. So I talked to, um, she was the, um, ad, like the contact for women in engineering at that time, one of the advisors, and um, she said, you know, I was... Um, I was sort of the same way. She said, you know, I started out general engineering because I just didn't really know. And she said, I ended up going with chemical, but I was very organized, very left-brained. And she said, looking back on it, I think industrial would have been a really good fit for me because of the the way that it looks at efficiencies and looks at ways to make different processes better. She said, I think I really would have enjoyed that. And so just learning a little bit about it from her, I decided to look into industrial engineering. And that was kind of what led me down that path. Well, what were some of the classes that would go along with that? I'm thinking physics or 
That's probably uh-huh. not so much. Well, those uh, we had to take all those basics, oh, general, just like gen eds. Mm-hmm. yeah. So physics one and two, um, we had to take several of what were called the engineering science classes, like um, strength of materials, um, material science, uh, dynamics, those those sorts of classes. So did all those, but then once you got into industrial engineering, it was more about um, like operations management. Um, Statistics was a big part of industrial engineering because you're trying to figure out like how to make a process better. So how well can you measure it with statistics and then how can you improve those in the, within the process itself? Um, so you look at different ways to um, uh, like plant layout is a, another part of it. So, you know, how do you lay out a, a plant or a building in, in a way that makes the most sense for how it's going to be operating? That's somewhat architect, I guess. A little bit, well, yeah. You think of it that way. Yeah, there's a little bit of that in it. And your math gets in there, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, lots of math. Well, did you struggle? Did any of the classes surprise you as, as difficulty? Yes. Um, I mean, there were several t- several semesters that were, were very difficult, especially when you're trying to get through all those, the physics, the engineering sciences. Um, I mean, that's really where they're testing all the students to see if they have what it takes to make it in engineering. So that's typically, you know, where students are weeded out. And I definitely had times that I thought, this may not be for me. <laughs> but um, I stuck it out, and it was it was definitely worth it. Well, in some of those classes, would you have more men than women? Oh, yeah. In some of the bigger mm-hmm, Absolutely. Do you have study groups? Yeah, yeah, and a lot of them we did. You could imagine that I would have to have one for every class. <laughs> <laughs> I probably needed one for every class. I don't know that we had one for every class, but yeah, it, it helps once you kind of, part of the challenge with that too is you're still kind of getting established with, you know, your friend groups and, mm-hmm. you know, because they may have come from your residence hall initially, and but those students aren't in engineering. So, you know, trying to find your, your people within your, your classes is a bit of a challenge sometimes too. Well, did they have some way of mentoring you as a young woman? Uh, they had um, advisors, and we were encouraged to be like in the Society for Women Engineers. And then they had that advisor that I mentioned that kind of helped guide me toward industrial engineering. And she was specific to women in engineering, so it, there was a lot of support in that regard. Had there been anyone in your family that was in in the engineering field? No, uh, my dad started out in engineering and um, was in a, a calculus class uh, where he had some difficulty understanding the professor and. Uh, I think uh, he, he jokes about how he made like a 4% on one of the exams and uh, just said, you know, that that was it. That was when I dropped the class and uh, he moved into business at that time. And I think he always kind of regretted that somewhat to not, you know, try to get in a different class or, or you know, try to get in the next semester or whatever might have worked out. But Well, I was just thinking some of your conversations, they would understand some of the concepts that you would be studying, mm-hmm. I guess, at, at least. Maybe yeah. Maybe. He would if he had well, at least one engineering class, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And my mom, uh, she taught all the advanced classes at the high school, so she ha- had a grasp on all that as well. Thinking in, in high school, did the guidance counselor encourage young women to go into the sciences the, or, or math or even? I remember it being more of a, um, you know, more of a focus on just going to college from, mm-hmm. from high school and, you know, making sure that you found the right place and got the scholarships that you needed and, and that sort of a thing. I don't really remember there being so much of a focus on what field you went into. Well, at least they didn't say, no, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> right. No, yeah. they definitely definitely didn't say anything like that. So. Okay. So once you got into the program and got up and running and doing all this, did you have a, like a group outside of the university that you would participate in, like young professionals or whatever they would call it in your in that field? Um, um, I was I did a little bit with the, the Society for Women Engineers, okay. and then um, I was also part of what was called the Seat Scholars Program. I think still is called Seat Scholars, but um, it was a program where they had selected and interviewed several of us our senior year of high school, and then um, you basically participated in it in different ways for all four years of undergraduate. So you took an intro, your intro to engineering class was with the dean. Um, it was Dean Carl Reed at that point. So I got to know him really early on, and he was always very supportive and um, a good mentor, too. Um, so we did that, and so that was a group that I was part of right off the bat, too. And then through that program, I also got to travel to Washington, D.C. Um, the summer, or the first two weeks right after my sophomore year, 
and then to Japan the first two weeks after my senior or my junior year. Wow. So yeah, it was, cool. it was very cool. Yeah. <laughs> what would you do when you were doing that? What was your what was the purpose of those trips? And they were all engineering focused. So we would do, and they brought culture into it as well. So we would have some days, and we typically got to be involved with planning the trips to a certain extent, especially with Washington, D.C. Um, so there would be days that we would get to go see the sites around D.C., more of kind of the cultural aspect of it, but then days where we were going to see the, you know, technical plants that we might be working in someday. Okay. Well, did you have to, did you have the opportunity to go out to high schools and help recruit more into the program? We did. Um, we got to participate in the interviews. So they would select, you know, whatever, however many students it was that they wanted to bring in to interview. And then we would, as students, we would be part of those interview panels. So you would have like a professor and maybe one or two students uh, that that student was talking to. And I think they called it Seat Scholars Day. It was a Saturday in the spring every year. What do you think the key the key is to, to bring in more women into the into the program? Is there one? Gosh, it's, it's so hard to say. Um, you know, I think when you have that affinity for um, for math and science, I think it's just knowing all of the, a lot of it is knowing all the different things you can do with engineering. Yep. Um, because I know that was something that I didn't really realize and how just having an engineering degree can put, can set you up for so many different types of jobs, um, really regardless of the, the field of engineering. Um, so I think that's something that and I think a lot of, you know, we've done some programs like since I've been in college and then as a professional where we'll go into elementary schools and just try to educate kids about what engineering even is. You know, that it's not somebody who works on a train, that it it means a lot of different things. So I think just getting that awareness out there helps a lot about how broad that field really is. Yeah, I'm not even sure what all in industrial engineers in, entails either. So, yeah. You know. Just haven't been exposed to it either so that's part of it yeah well and that's i mean most people typically think of it in regards to manufacturing like going into a plant and improving their processes helping them be more efficient but what's great about industrial engineering is that you really can't apply it to anything so i mean when i first started with exxon mobile i was charged with like looking at pricing processes um, in a certain division and you know trying to make those better and more streamlined so really any type of process you could look at and, and streamline it, find ways to improve it. And that's kind of what industrial engineering all goes back to. Efficiency. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So you graduated in 09. Do you remember graduation day? Mm -hmm. I do. Parents yeah. come up? They did, yeah. Yeah, parents, grandparents. Um, my brother was here at that time. Uh, he was three years behind me. So we overlapped by two years here at OSU since I went five. That was fun too. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. But yeah, I just, um, yeah, what I remember about graduation is how, you know, crazy it was getting there because I was involved in all these different activities. And, um, you know, I think I hardly slept that, that last year. And then all of a sudden you get to graduation. And after that, it's over. It's like you go from running all the time to not really having anything to do until you start work. So it's pretty, pretty abrupt. But, or did you have a car while you were on campus? Mm -hmm, I did. Had to share with your brother, or did he have one too? No, he had one too. So, so. Had to, yeah, so. we we did live together that last year that we were here. But that's good too. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, when you were getting ready to graduate, I'm assuming you were already looking in the job market, looking to see, or how long did that? How did that process work? Um, um, so I interned with a Spirit Aerosystems in uh, Wichita, Kansas, the summer before my last year here. Um, and I also took the uh, GMAT test uh, that summer because I was looking at graduate schools too because I just didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. So I um, did that. Um, Spirit made me, made me an offer to come work for them full time after graduation, but they wanted an answer very early. Like I think it was either by end of September or early October of my senior year or my last year. And um, just I just wasn't ready to say that that was you know where I was going to live, what I was going to do forever. So ultimately ended up turning them down. But um, it was a great offer. It was actually in pricing as well. So never really realized that that's you know what I would be doing. But that's what the internship was in and um, what that position was that they offered me. And then um, I did a lot of different on campus interviews with all sorts of different companies, just not really knowing. Um, and then met um, a woman that I actually work with now at ExxonMobil named Stacy at a Women in Engineering breakfast one morning. 
she was there for on-campus interviews with ExxonMobil. And, um, you know, knowing that graduation was coming up in the spring, she said, so, you know, what do you want to do? What are, what are you looking at? And I kind of told her uh, that I was looking at grad schools, looking at different job opportunities and kind of, you know, what I was interested in. Um, and she said, well, you know, I'm a project manager at, at ExxonMobil, and a lot of what you're describing kind of sounds like what I do. She said, would you be interested in coming to, to talk to us for one of our on-campus interviews? And so I, of course, said yes and went and met with them. And uh, that was in October, I believe. And uh, they ended up offering me a uh, on-campus interview in Fairfax, Virginia in early January. That's a little ways from home. So, yeah, <laughs> long ways from home. Um, at that time, uh, their downstream headquarters uh, were in Fairfax, Virginia, which is just six miles west of D.C., so I went up there in January of my, my last year here and I uh, did their face-to-face -face interview and they uh, made me an offer for what ended up being a pricing analyst position, oddly enough. Housed out of what career? There? In Fairfax. Oh, in Fairfax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Trek it across country then. Huh? Yeah. That was a big jump. But yeah, I moved up there in uh, July of, of 2009, so a couple months after graduation. And did you have much interaction with her once you got there? I really didn't because she was based in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, and even now, um, since I live here, I mean, I don't see her very much, but I, I help out with some of the OSU recruiting events and she coordinates a lot of that. So we at least get to talk more than what we used to. So. Well, once you got there, were there other, other women already in position that, that you could at least communicate with or? Yes. Yeah, there were. Um, there was a young woman who had been hired a year before me. So she was uh, freshly out of college. And this department that I was hired into hadn't brought any new hires in for like 20 years until that summer before. So she and I uh, were the only two young. Well, no, there was one other young woman that came in at the same time I did. So it was the three of us, really. And then there were um, a few that had more experience in that department as well. Primarily more men? Generally, um, generally yeah. So that, have you been, you're still with them? Mm-hmm. Jumped around a little bit, but yeah, still went with back them. with them now. Well, have you always, has your boss, your supervisor, been male and female off and on, or has it generally been the male throughout the... the um, I've had, time? I guess I've had two female supervisors. Um, I took leave from ExxonMobil for a couple of years and I um, actually worked at the OSU Foundation and then the university, um, so... While I was doing that, I had a female supervisor, and um, my second supervisor at ExxonMobil was female as well. Can you tell a difference between? You can, yeah. Really? I, yeah, I have been able to, and I think it probably depends on, you know. I'm sure, the individual. Says. Right. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest difference, you think, from your just from your experience? Yeah. Um, I noticed that, um, like with my first manager, he was very good about, you know, he kind of knew my capability and was very good about turning me loose, like saying, okay, this is your project, like, you know, touch base with me whenever you need something, want feedback, that sort of thing, but otherwise run with it. And um, she was much more hands-on, you know, like it would take us so much longer to, to get things done because she wanted to be involved in all the different steps of making the decision or the process. So, I mean you know, can, can be good and bad, depending on, on what the situation is. Well, have you been in a position where you supervise? Um, I supervised a student worker when I was at the OSU Foundation, but not otherwise. So are you, like in 10 years, you see yourself doing something similar? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm compromising a little bit on career by wanting to live here in Stillwater. Sure. Um, sure. You know, if I were to say that I would move to Houston, I could have all sorts of, of job opportunities with ExxonMobil, but my husband has a business here and we have a daughter on the way. So we, you know, we want to stay here and we like the small town life rather than the suburb, big city life. So. And pretty close to grandma then, huh? Yes. <laughs> At yeah. least your side. Of, I'm sure his Well, his, his side as well because his parents live here in town. Okay. So. So, I mean, what's, it's been a, well, I don't know if it's been a, yeah, it's unusual from what I've gathered for young women to stay in engineering, pick it to begin with, and then stay, stay with it. Mm -hmm. If you were giving advice to a young girl thinking about it, what would you, what would you tell them? I would say stick with it because it, it's definitely worth it. Um, I mean, just 
know that you have so many opportunities, you know, that whether you're a chemical engineer, industrial engineer, whatever your degree is in, you still have so many opportunities. I mean, I was in industrial engineering and I've been a pricing analyst a, in two different lines of business, a market advisor. Um, I worked at the university in scholarship administration. Um, and now I'm what's called an industrial sales engineer where I sell different types of lubricants to big industrial plants like paper mills and steel mills. And so, I mean, I've really, even in just the nine years that I've been out of college, I've had a number of different experiences. So don't feel like you're going to be, you know, limited to one type of job or one field because really the, the sky is the limit. When they see engineering, they feel like you have a broad range of capability and knowledge from school and they'll they really trust you in a lot of cases to to do a lot of different things. Well, then what you're doing now is completely different than what you started doing. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. Completely different. Mm -hmm. Well, how would you learn the various products that you were selling? Um, for this particular job, they actually had a, a training program. Um, so I went back through, I mean, I, I started in a training program right after college, obviously, but I went back into training with them. Um, this this job is typically held more by students coming right out of college. Um, but for me, wanting to live here in Oklahoma, it was what was available. And they were looking for someone who, you know, wouldn't want to cut and run within two or three years to do something else in Houston or wherever the place may be. So, um, so yeah, I went through um, about two-month training program that kind of took us through the products. and But a lot of it is just learning once you get in the field and you're making product recommendations for customers and seeing the applications hands on. Do you have to go to that to the out to them or is it all? I do. Um I work from home a couple days a week and then typically travel to see customers three three days a week. Just in Oklahoma or any anywhere in the States? No, um Oklahoma is my territory with just a little piece of Arkansas. Okay. So we have positions like mine all over the country. So it's drivable. Most yeah, all drivable, um, and typically where I can be home at night, which is nice. Sure. Few few overnight trips, but not bad. Did you envision this is what your career would be like when you you know? No, <laughs> no. I mean, I, I think it's so hard to know what your career is going to look like. Um, when I first started with the company and was on their campus in Virginia, I mean, I I worked all the time. I was very much focused on my career, and you know they had me as someone pegged for management and upper management and that sort of thing eventually. And, um, you know, then things happen and you want to be back closer to family and met the guy that's now my husband and your, all your priorities just kind of change, or at least mine did. They don't have to change, but for me, they did. Well, from what you're saying, though, with that back with your background, your options, will, there will always be options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. Depends on how much I'm willing to travel and, you know, like there's there's different positions that I could do from Oklahoma, but a lot of them would involve national travel. So where I would be, you know, flying, staying in hotels more and for where we are in life right now, that's just not what what I'm looking to do. I want to be home at night with kiddos. And so. Well, Exxon Mobil, I don't know much about. I mean, Conoco is what you hear about mostly. In, in right. In Oklahoma. Oklahoma. So there's some competition there, I guess. Sure. Yeah friendly or otherwise, I guess, but oh yeah, a uh, pretty good company to work for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they've been, too. been a great company. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they were, um, whenever this position came open, I was finishing my master's at the university, and um, I had just taken leave with, uh, with ExxonMobil. I hadn't officially resigned, so they basically had me marked as on leave for education, but never really imagined myself going back because all of the jobs were in Houston and I knew that I really didn't want to live in Houston because um, at that time they had moved the Fairfax campus from Virginia to Houston, which we, we all knew was going to happen, but that, that had already occurred. So when this manager called me and asked me if I would be interested in the job that I'm in now, I said I would be, but you have to understand that I want to stay in Oklahoma. So if I come back, you know, because they're – they're very big on developing people and moving them from job to job. So typically once every year and a half or two, you're going to be doing something different. Mm -hmm. So I knew that, you know, the, the direction would be, okay, she'll do this for a few years for us. And then we'll look at developing her and moving her on to something else. And so I just wanted to be very clear with them before I, before coming back that, you know, this was the place for me. And so for the foreseeable future, I didn't see any plans to move to South Texas.
But at least they called you, so you left a good impression to begin with, or they wouldn't have called it and offered to offer. Sure. Yeah. To bring the, you back. Yeah. They. That's what I look back on. All that hard work I did up in Virginia when I wasn't doing much else uh, <laughs> must have paid off a little bit. So. Well, in a typical day there, what would you do? Um, you working all that time. Typical day there. Um, I mean, I was pretty extreme because I and I really loved what I was doing. I loved my manager. I loved my job. You know, I was excited to be in the workforce for the first time. So, I would leave the house crazy early, like six o'clock usually, to uh, get to work to beat the traffic. So I would be there from 6.30 to typically 6.30 or 7 at night. Long day. Mm -hmm. And um, and I would, I mean, every day would vary a little bit, but, you know, you would have different meetings, um, whether they were like calls that I was participating on with sales teams, with people who were out in the field to learn what they were hearing about pricing or calls that I had set up to like drive improvement projects that I was working on because I got I did get to improve a lot of processes and try to make things better with different management of change processes. So, so you computerized at that point, most of your work would be on the computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all on the computer. Yeah, so had a cubicle where I would be working independently or would be in a conference room with a group. What about how big of a group? Um, just depending on what the meeting was for, um, you know, maybe my boss and the market advisor, um, maybe a supply person, if, if we were in a, a meeting in a conference room. So anywhere from five to six or seven people was probably a pretty typical meeting size group. Well, if they're developing up and comers uh, or above you, I mean, either two or three layers up, there were other women that had, had conned, had Taking that same path, similar path? Mm -hmm. um, there was a one, she's, I think she had about eight years of experience when I started. So she was in a market advisor role at the time that I was doing the, the pricing position. Um, and she uh, actually works in, in a sales, uh, sales manager role now. Um, she still lives on the East Coast because she's another one who didn't want to uh, compromise location for her career. So... Um, I, I, but I do get to see her at some of our big sales meetings and things a couple times a year. Any other OSU alum? Uh, we do have some. Um, there's another manager who's out of Denver, and uh, she's an OSU alum. So I see her quite a bit more, actually, because she's part of my, my region. So if you do a good job, then they're going to come back and get more like you. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. In theory, yes. Yeah, we, um, we have another um, young man who just started for us this past summer. Um, he's doing a job out of, a sales job out of Houston um, that came from OSU. So, yeah, it seems like they're recruiting more and more from here, which is good. Well, orange and black out there. Then. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> they know what Orange Fridays mean and all that good stuff. What's big, the biggest challenge? What's been the biggest challenge in, in your career so far? I think that balance between work and family life, personal life, um, and you know, figuring out how you how you navigate that at work, and you know, knowing that it's okay to to say no and to set your own standards for because at the end of the day, you know, you only have so much time in life, and how do you how do you want to spend it? You really have to kind of be purposeful about that. I found, mm -hmm. and that's not always the easiest thing to do, especially when you're young in your career and you think that. The expectations are this, and they might be, but it's also okay to say, well, my expectations are this, and we have to figure out how to compromise. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of, and like I said, I think it all works out for a reason, because I think the the hours and the work that I did when I first started with the company helped pay off later for me to be able to kind of, you know, pick my location to a certain degree and say, well, this is where I want to be, you know, if it works, great, if it doesn't, okay, but... Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it all kind of comes around the way it's supposed to be. But, yeah, that's that's definitely a challenge. And to remember that, you know, even if it's not what your ideal circumstances are in the moment, like there's a plan, it's going to it's gonna work out. Because I look back and think I never really had any reason to worry, you know, about how I would get back home or how I would get to the next job. It's always kind of been come together pretty easily if you look back on it. But when you're in it, it's not always easy to remember. That's true. Have there been any surprises? Things you weren't expecting? I mean, just doing this job was was a surprise. When I first started with the company, it wasn't um, one that was really on my list. Um, sales sounded pretty scary, quite frankly. Yes. So, um, and there are days that I still think, well, it's a little scary. But, um, I mean, 
meeting with the customers and that sort of thing isn't. But when you look at the numbers and the targets and the expectations, that can sometimes be overwhelming. So just, and it's a very technical sale. I mean, you know, these customers have million dollar equipment that they're putting our lubricants in and Mm -hmm. a big part of how they do that depends on how the the plan ultimately runs and if there's any downtime it's you know it could be a hundred thousand dollars for a day of downtime so a little bit of pressure there yeah yeah definitely some pressure so yeah just just doing this job was has been a surprise well in a typical day now what would that be be like there's kind of two di- two typical types of days. Um, a day like today where I'm working in the office and I have a little bit more flexibility. So there would be conference calls, emails, um, you know, pricing, um, administrative tasks that I have to do, things like that. So pretty much all on the computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and like today we had a um, customer concern about quality, about water being in their oil. So, you know, we have to figure out how we manage that with the distributor in our plant and our operations group. So... Every day is, is typically a little bit different, but um, but that's what an office day looks like. And then a day where I go see customers, um, typically getting up pretty early, um, you know, getting to a customer site um, to meet with them, to uh, do an equipment inspection. Uh, we'll do training in a lot of cases on lubrication for groups at their site so they better understand how to, to lubricate their equipment properly and just help them with any questions that they might have about oil. Um, so you have to be able to, to teach them mm-hmm. or if someone goes with you? No, you have to be. Yes, I, I do a lot of it on my own. We do have a um, what we call lubrication engineering position that's typically more technically minded than what my job is. So my job would focus a little bit more on the business side where a lube engineer would focus more on the technical. Okay. Um, but yeah, the expectation is still for me to be able to answer their questions and, and do those types of things. At least understand how the machine works. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yes. I think that would be challenging for some of us. It has been for me. Yeah, I uh, you know never imagined knowing quite as much as I do now about a hydraulic system or an engine or a gear or anything like that. Well, are they surprised that a, that a woman knows as much as you do about such things? Yes, and I think um, you know in in a place like Oklahoma, you still have a lot of people who don't expect a woman to to be in this type of job. So, and on a, on a customer side, especially, I'm very often the only woman in the room. Mm-hmm. So I think that they're, um, I think once I start talking and, you know, demonstrating my knowledge, they figure out that there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it is a surprise in a lot of cases. Mm, it's kind of hard to balance that, too, with not wanting to show them how much, you know, right off the bat if someone's letting their comments be known. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Big machines, too, I would think. Oh, yeah. Big yeah, machines. huge. Mm-hmm. You have huge gear stands, and yeah. yeah, like I said, pretty intimidating whenever you first come into something like this, and the fact that we put people fresh out of college into these jobs is a little bit of a shock to me, because I think it would be very difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had, you know, some confidence, a little bit of confidence built up from other jobs, and, you know, you develop a thicker skin over time in the corporate world, but, and for somebody fresh out of college, it... I can see how it would be difficult. Yeah, especially a female, I would think, that didn't know how to, you know, hadn't had the experience of putting a, working on an engine with their dad or you know, something like that, right. too, just the simple, basic stuff. Right. Well, and being in the office first, I developed a network of people, you know, that I can reach out to and, you know, that I'll still see if I go to camp, to the ExxonMobil campus for something. Um, but if you're straight out of the straight out of college you really don't have that network so it's harder to find people to I think it would be more difficult to find people to reach out to I think we try to do to assign them mentors and you know to make sure that they feel like they're getting um getting that type of support but I still think that would be a bigger challenge or the typical if if it's not a good fit they don't stay long out with us yeah and that's that's been a problem in the past I think that's a big part of the reason why they wanted somebody who wanted to be in Oklahoma rather than just somebody who was out of college. And, you know, you tell them that they, they might be from East Coast and you tell them that they're going to go to Oklahoma and they're, they say, excuse me, like, that's not really my ideal location if you're you're not from here. So do they offer often or like have someone shadow you? Um, not me so much, because typically um, 
So what they do now more is bring people in for internships for a summer and um, kind of give them exposure to the campus, the office environment. And then we have um, people who do the same thing I do based in Houston. Mm -hmm. So it would be much more common for those folks down there to take these these young people out for, for field rides. But yeah, we, we do a lot of that to try to expose them to what the job is and make sure that it's something that they don't just say they're interested in, but they really would be interested in. So, well, Exxon Mobil, they, you wouldn't have to go out to sites where they're pumping oil. We don't go out to a lot of fracking sites. No, um, been to a few natural gas sites, mm-hmm. but um, and we do provide oil to some some fracking sites. But typically, we're working with more of a centralized office. Um, like I work with one in Tulsa that has field sites. All over, all over Oklahoma, some in Canada, um, but we're typically meeting with their folks in the office in Tulsa. And the coast of refineries are close to the refineries. I think Tulsa has a refinery, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah they, well, they have the Holly refinery. That, but I guess. Hmm. So you don't, it's it's interesting, you know, those of us who don't know much about it, it's, it's uh, varied, let's put it that way. Yes. A variety of things that to do or not do. Yeah, it um yeah, it's a, a number of different like I was in a, a brick manufacturing plant last week. Um, you know, just and that's what's cool about my job is that you get to see how all these different things are made that you would never have any idea before. So Well do you have to get your hands dirty? In a lot of cases, yeah. So was um one of my um days last week was doing a gear inspection with um a lubrication engineer down in Durant at a, a new steel mill that they're putting up and they wanted us to look at the gears before they went into operation to kind of get a baseline um because then they're look then we'll be looking for wear um on the machine um in subsequent years so wanted us to see what they look like fresh out of the the box basically um so you take pictures so you can have mm-hmm. something to compare yeah to. we take pictures and then she'll the lube engineer will write up a report on you know that we saw minor concerns here and there but nothing of, of major concern in that way whenever we look at the gears next year, we'll look back at these pictures and make sure that everything looks like just normal everyday wear, nothing where they have like an alignment issue or something like that. So if you're getting dirty, would you have to, a tire would be a, yeah, we have, um, yeah, we have some nice um, coveralls that we'll wear in, in some cases. Yeah. Coveralls, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. And gloves, I guess. Yeah. Gloves. Yeah. Those are, those are handy, especially when you're reaching into surfaces that are usually oily if they're lubricated right. So have you experienced anything that's dangerous? Um typically they're, you know, most customers are very safety minded. ExxonMobil yeah. has a very high regard for safety. So if there's ever anything that we don't feel comfortable doing, they wouldn't want us doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, probably the most dangerous thing I do is driving to and from these sites. So wow. Good. Yeah, fascinating to see to see all how all this comes together. Yeah, you should be go, you should go back and, and have a like and be an invited lecturer at one of the classes at, mm-hmm. on campus, and that would help other people get an idea of what what's possible. Yeah, every once in a while I get the opportunity to do like an OSU recruiting event or, or something like that, and um, told the um, told Dean Pulaski that I would be more more than happy to you know to help with anything like that that they ever needed. So. And they still have the women in Society for Women in Engineering. I, as far as I know, they do. They still have the local chapter here. Yeah, I think they do too. Do you do? Are you involved with them in any way now? now? No, I haven't been involved since I I got out. I was um, I was in mortar board as a student here, and so I was the mortar board advisor for a few years when I first came back uh, to Stillwater and enjoyed that, but just got to where. I didn't feel like I had the time to do it the way that it really needed to be done. Mm-hmm. So this is the second year, I guess, that I've been out. Yeah. Well, if you're on the road a lot, I mean, that's more than an eight-hour day, I guess, if you're having to drive. It can be, yeah. To, to Durant and back. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was a long day. And then there's days like today where, you know, it, it's an easy eight-hour day. So Do you ever have to go out to the panhandle? Um, I don't get to go out there very often. Um, it would be nice because my parents obviously just live well, where they live is in the northeast corner of the Texas Panhandle, so it's like 15 miles from the Oklahoma line. It's close to Texoma? Yeah, not too far. Yeah, I've been to Texoma. Okay. <laughs> yeah, y'all probably kind of get all over with these interviews too. Yeah. 
yeah, I got that one. And that was a nice drive. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it is. Pussy. It is actually a nice drive. You get to see some interest in uh, grain elevators. Me too. Different stages and shapes. Yeah. <laughs> Conditions at this point. Yeah, very different yeah. from going to a big city. Yes. Kind very of much. Total opposite of the spectrum. And yeah, going to Virginia is quite different from from here too. So it was very different. It was a. Uh, it was a great place to live for a few years and to get to see a lot of that culture and history up there. But uh, definitely um, growing up where I grew up and being used to the, you know, driving from one end of town to the other in five or ten minutes, it's uh, an adjustment to live someplace like that. Yeah, and be able to see the skies out here. It's yes. It's different, too. I've yeah. Heard. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very partial to, to that and to the people here, too. People in Texas and Oklahoma are really second to none as far as I'm concerned. So. Well, we've covered a lot of things. Uh, can you think of something that I've not asked that might be interesting for young women or others to know about what it is you do? Um, I think we've probably covered most of it. Um, work environment varies. Well, we've got that. Have you had to do something that was outside of your comfort zone? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've all, I've, I, with every job I've, I've had, I felt like I've pushed my comfort zone a little bit in some way. Um, with this job, it's more the technical aspect of it, of, you know, having to figure out how an engine works or having a customer call you and say, you know, this or that failed and I have to figure out why. Um, I mean, I would say like in, in every case with pushing your comfort zone, like that's a good thing to do, but to always remember that, you know, there's other, there's support for, you know, like when I have a customer that calls me and tells me something fails, there's other engineers that I can call and get feedback and assistance from. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to remember that you're not just out there on an island by yourself. Um, so. So on a question like that, you wouldn't necessarily Google the answer then? Not so much, no, because <laughs> so many different things could cause that problem. And it's typically not the oil um, is what we find. Um, typically, it's something that's gotten into the oil from their environment or, you know, maybe they miss changing the oil one time or something like that. Um, it typically goes back to, you know, something that's happened or a change that's happened in their operation that uh, just wasn't adjusted for. Well, it would take a little time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. It can take time. And their first instinct is always that it's the oil. Mm -hmm. So we have to, you know, you have to balance that of, can we understand you have a problem, but we're going to help you figure it out. But... You know, you can't um, can't just take the blame like like they often want to assign to you. So some communication ability and skill comes in. in oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then let me back up. Were you in 4-H or, or uh, something like that in high school where you would learn to do in, speech and that sort of thing? No, no I was in um, in student council, National Honor Society. Um, so I did some activities that would would involve some speaking, but yeah. debate team. No, no, I was never a debater. <laughs> but we might have some things that would translate over. No, I was kind of kind of more on the shy side. Debate would have been a, a, out of my comfort zone in, in high school. Well, it'd be in the shy then, it would be hard to go into or challenging the book to go into a room full of men and, and tell them something that they didn't think you ought to know. Yes, yes. yeah, exactly. I can see that. Yeah, it was good that I had this job a little bit later in, in my career rather than first first thing out of college hmm. well do you think being a woman brings anything unique to to your position that, that's helpful in that yeah absolutely I think um you know I think women are typically more detail oriented um so I mean there's a lot of that in, in my job and you know making sure that you check all the requirements of the piece of equipment that you're going to be putting the oil in or you know making sure everything on the pricing side is is correct um, I think that can be I think that's a little bit more of a, a detail-oriented thing that women could be. And, you know, I, I mean, I think in a lot of cases we're a little bit more cool-headed than what, you know, a hot-tempered guy might be who's upset because his piece of equipment has gone down. So yeah. it, that can go either way. But yeah. Well, intuition, does that come into play too, you think? Yeah, I think so. so. I mean, I think so much of it... Um, at the end of the day, yes, I have to know all these technical things about equipment, but it, you know, so much of it too is your 
the way that you interact with people mm-hmm. and intuition plays a lot into that. So that's it. And in your in your position, it seems it seems like it would be a big part of it. Mm-hmm. Do you know any pioneering women in the industrial field? Let's see. Like what are the big names? I couldn't tell you that in my own field, so if you can't answer it, it's not, <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, any names come to mind? Like in, in the industrial engineering field in yeah. general? Yeah. Um, you know, not that I can really think of. That's fine. But then I can't tell you mine either. I would say here at the university, um, in the industrial engineering field, Camille DeYoung, like I mentioned, is... Yeah she's one of very few women in that department and I think she I think a lot of others um, like me would agree that she was a, a good influence on them in college mm-hmm. what are some of the most important lessons you've learned so far on this on this journey um, just a few I think um, I think like I mentioned before um, you know finding that balance and um, you know making sure that you don't compromise um, or what you think other people, your employer, whoever wants you to do, you know, finding out what it is that really makes you happy. And that sounds like a cliche, but really, I think it's important to, to figure out what that is. And um, I mean, I think I always knew that family and home, you know, were big things that made me happy. And that's why it was so hard for me to go to college and then eventually make that move to Virginia. Mm-hmm. I think those were important things for me to do because they did push my comfort zone and, you know, showed me that I could do probably a lot more than what I ever thought I could. Um, But, um, you know, I think knowing that being here, you know, being close to my family, getting to have a family of my own, those were things that, I mean, I never could have imagined how happy they would make me. And so, you know, I think making that move to say, I'm, I'm leaving Virginia, I'm coming back to Oklahoma, you know, to be closer to my family, um, ultimately ended up with me focusing more on education for a while until I figured out the career piece. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think all of that has been, you know, something very important that, that I would definitely, you know, want, want everybody to think about. Well, um, to me too, it seems like you need to do your homework before you go into each situation too like if they've called with a problem and you're, you do the homework before you go back and say well it's x y and z or whatever mm-hmm. and then yeah. you do some i would assume some research before oh yeah yeah and yeah like, unless it's a call you get a, a common call right right no there's definitely going to be and i'm i mean I, I constantly learn in my job i mean there's still things that i you know haven't come across before and with the job i, th- I think a lot of jobs you're, you're going to find that that you know, you're, you're always going to be learning and, and it's important to remember what supports you have and what resources are in place. Cause again, you don't have to do, you know, everything on your own. Like with that quality issue this morning, I called the lubrication engineer that I worked with and I said, you know, this is what I think. What do you think before we kind of formed our response back to the customer? So yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely important to, to do your homework. And well, is, do, are there conferences like academics go to conferences, are there similar things that industrial engineers will go to? Um, I think I'm sure there are. It probably depends on what field they're working in. But not, um, what, you're, not, what, not what you're doing, you don't. Um, we have different trade shows so that will right. support. Yeah. So like, you know, there's the wind industry, there's um, oil and gas has, has conferences that will support. So um, for me personally, I don't get into a lot of that. I have supported the wind trade show um, one year in New Orleans. Um, is just part of our, our Exxon Mobil team that was there. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we get into a, a little bit of that, but um, it would be, I think, more specific to industry than to field or than to education field. Wind would be something that Oklahoma's involved with. Yes, very involved. I mean, no matter where you drive, you see more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or you're behind them on the, on the road going to wherever they're going. That's true too, and they're long. They are. But what you you your current job doesn't have anything to do with with that part of. Um, I get into that a little bit. Um, that's more managed from a, a national perspective. Like most of those wind companies are pretty large. So, mm-hmm. the business that I do is through distributors, like local distributors. So I'm typically working more with them on companies that are based in, here in Oklahoma. You know, that don't necessarily have a a big national tie. Um. So for those, we have a national accounts team that would work with them to manage all their accounts across the country, and I would support them in different ways, but I wouldn't really 
be the one to go after and get that business. And that's sort of how the wind business works is there may be some support that they need locally, but for the most part, that's all managed at a different level than me. It would be neat to go up and be able to say what was wrong with one inside when you watch it work, I mm -hmm. would think. Yeah. Maybe not, but yeah. Yeah, no, it is interesting. They have a gearbox way up in those those wind turbines. Um, and they have to be lubricated, too. I guess. They do, yeah. yeah. So a lot of people don't realize that you actually need oil to make the wind industry work. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but, yeah, they um, obviously they don't like to change out that oil any more often than they have to because they're having to send somebody way up there to, to make that change. So there's different oils that will let them go, like, seven years before they have to, to do a change out. Oh. So. So yeah, we're um, we're very involved in that industry, but as far as like me getting to go on a wind turbine, that that hasn't happened. I was gonna say, I mean, it looks like they're big enough to stand up inside of them, but I don't know if. That's oh yeah, true. they're they're what huge. They yeah, just mm -hmm. just the propellers are so much bigger than what what you realize until you're right up on them. Yeah, it's more like a mobile home parked up there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, perspective there. Mm -hmm. You don't think about that either, but you know you're right about the, the needing the fixing too. Repair, repairs, I think, was something that, uh, I don't know, I wish you had talked about for a while, but I'm not sure what they did with that. Key to success. I think you said that it was open, being open to different directions too. Yeah, being open and hard work. I think that was always a, a key for me. And be prepared. Yeah. Be prepared. Absolutely. Okay, then my last question, unless you've got something else, I always like to ask with how do you want to be remembered when someone says, Caroline, you know, tell us something about Caroline. What do you, how do you want to be remembered? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I definitely want to be remembered as someone who, um, you know, who went out and did a lot of things on my own, you know, before I ever found that family of my own, um, you know, I've, I want to remember somebody who was brave enough to, you know, go off and live somewhere else and do something completely different and, um, you know, have a house of my very own in Virginia and then eventually come back home and, you know, still have that focus on career and, um, you know, but have that that importance of family life, too. And one of my favorite things is I'm, I'm a mentor through a program that we have at ExxonMobil, and I love that. Um, she's a, a girl who's she's transitioning from her first job to her second job with the company. Um, and so just, you know, I'm the person that she can call and ask questions that she doesn't have to worry about, you know, it going back to her supervisor or anything like that. It's a very just open communication and for me to give her advice or, you know, answer her questions. And I always tell her that on those days that we have our calls, like that's the most important thing I do. So I want to be remembered as someone, you know, who was willing to help others and, you know, mentor and, and give advice like that where I could. Have you met her in person? Mm hmm I have. Yeah. Is, she, is she Oklahoma connected? Um, she actually grew up in Kansas. Oh, close um, enough. Yeah, and she uh, has been working in Bentonville, Arkansas. We have some jobs there primarily connected to our business with Walmart because they require that you have people in Bentonville, um, and she's transitioning to a job in Houston. So, But I did get to meet her at our last uh, sales meeting before she moved. Where did she get her degree from? Um, I believe she went to, I think she went to KU in Lawrence. Okay. Comparable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's neat, too, to be able to, you know, be the back, you know, have, have someone's back that's, that's young right out, of a, yeah. right out of school. Cool. Yeah, I got to be on, a, on an alumni panel for Mortar Board recently, um, and, you know, just those types of things. I, I didn't feel like I had the time to be the official advisor for the group anymore, but I still love being able to go back and do things like that. And because some of those, um, there were a couple of girls who asked me questions that I could tell were, you know, right on the cusp of trying to figure out what they wanted to do. And so the questions were like, you know, what, how important do you think it was for you to go to Virginia and would you do all that over again? And, you know, you, you could just tell where it kind of where their minds were at that point and to be able to think like, yeah, you know, I mean, ultimately they're going to make their own decision, but to give them some feedback to hopefully make them feel better about it, you know, that's that's valuable. Well, and an impact. Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. So you went back to get a master's or you started to? I did. Uh -huh. master's from? Um, it ended up being from here in business administration, but I started at George Mason in Fairfax okay. and then transferred. So what year did you graduate with your master's from here? 
Um, I officially finished in 16, May of 16. So a PhD, maybe? Um, you know, it's something I think about. Okay, um, good. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what field it would be in, but it's definitely not something that I've ruled out yet. So. Yeah, well, good. I hope that I hope that comes to pass. <laughs> you'd be a good role model for others. Oh, mm-hmm. you already are, but you'd be even a bigger, bigger role for, at that point. Too. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Anything else you want to add? I think no. that covers it pretty well. All right. Well, thank you for sharing today. It's been fun. Absolutely. No, thank you for having me.